All right, we are back for part three of foreign direct investment chapter. And here we're going to look at uh, sort of the intersection of politics and uh, foreign direct investment because, <clears throat> because governments have to give permission on many parts of the world. So there are some countries in the past which actually completely uh, were hostile to foreign direct investment. And that's what we call the radical view. So they had roots in the in the Marxist political economic theory where multinational enterprises were considered an instrument of imperialist domination. Uh, this, this view was a very influential from 1945 to 1980s, but today is, is no longer accepted, except for North Korea, Cuba, nobody believes in this. Uh, and some of the reasons are the collapse of communism in Eastern Europe. Uh, and the very abysmal performance of these countries that embrace the radical position. Their people who are poor, the country is impoverished. Uh, and they're the countries which embraced capitalism after the Berlin Wall fell down in 1989. Uh, so that uh, spurred other countries to also change their view. So on the other side of the of the view of foreign debt and management is the free market view, which has classical roots in economic theory and, uh, of, of Adam Smith and David Ricardo, uh, which says that international production should be distributed among countries according to the theory of competitive advantage. So whoever is good in producing whatever they produce, that should be, let the market decide. Uh, and the and that free uh, foreign direct investment benefits both the source country and the host country. So the source country would be the, if a US company goes to Japan, that would be the source country, the host country would be Japan. In between the radical view and the free market view is what we call pragmatic nationalism, and which basically says that foreign direct investment has both benefits and cost. So there's no such thing as a free lunch and it pursues policies designed to maximize the national benefits and minimize national cost. Uh, there's a tendency to aggressively court FDI uh, because if it's believed to be in the national interest through their tax break or, 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 or grants. Okay. So this ideology has been shifting um, more, if, more towards the free market more liberal foreign direct investment. There's a surge in FDI all over the world, in China, India, Vietnam, and all these considered, all these countries before 1980 were not very uh, conducive to foreign direct investment, but they have changed their, uh, their position completely. Today, Venezuela, Bolivia, in addition to North Korea and uh, Cuba are still hostile to uh, foreign direct investment. Okay. I'm now going to talk about the cost and benefits of FDI to, for, from the host country point of view as well as the, uh, the home country point of view. So from the host country, which is the one receiving the FDI, this is, they get resource transfer effects. So they get uh, uh, suppliers, capital, technology, management resources. Uh, these are all the company bringing in all these things. So if you have, uh, let's say, uh, you know, a major company like Tesla, which is putting up a plant in China or Germany, which they are, they are bringing with them all these things which benefit the host country. There are a lot of employment effects. So it brings in jobs to the host country that otherwise would be created there. Uh, it may be offset by jobs in the home country. So there is some, you want to create new jobs in the host country, uh, which will not be there without uh, foreign direct investments. Continuing with the host country benefits, there's a balance of payment effect. Uh, and basically what this uh, means is that, uh, that uh, money is flowing from the host country, sorry, from the home country to the host country and the balance of payment tracks all these. Uh, it's also the current account tracks the exports and imports. So depending on the situation, it may affect the current account and the overall balance of payments. 
So how does it affect the balance of payments exactly? So countries prefer to run as current account surplus, which we saw in uh, in the in the uh, in the video on the balance of payments. Uh, so foreign direct investment helps create a current because it's a substitutes for imports. So the country which is now is hosting a foreign company would not be importing it because it's being produced there. So, so that's a very big uh, plus for the current account because you're not importing it anymore. And if the subsidiary is exporting, so for example, Honda, which is in Ohio, exports cars to Japan and other, and that is considered U.S. exports, not Japanese export because it is based in, in the U.S. So it helps the U.S. balance of payments. Uh, in terms of competition and economic growth, uh, so you can see that uh, the Greenfield investment creates a new enterprise, creates a new number of players, and therefore an increase in customer choice. Uh, particularly important for service where exporting is not an option. So it stimulates competition, uh, investments, lower prices. So there's a lot of lot of benefits towards the home country in terms of competition and like, and basically it benefits us towards uh, consumers. So in the America where we have a lot of competition and everybody wants to be here, the benefit is for uh, consumers. The adverse effect is on competition because subsidiaries of foreign multinational may have greater economic power than indigenous competitors. Uh, so that could be actually have an adverse effect because if Coke or Pepsi enters a market, then the local players just cannot stand up to it. Uh, so this could uh, uh, this could uh, you know be be detrimental. Uh, with an acquisition, it's a little different. Uh, it could be neutral uh, because especially if it's a it's a it's a monopoly or something. Uh, now we're coming to the host country before we had uh, uh, on, the, on the balance of payments, adverse effects. Uh, so if, a, uh, if the, when you send an earnings, your profits back to the parent country, there is capital outflow. So, so, so that's a negative on the, on the balance of payments. Uh, if you're importing, importing inputs from abroad, that's a debit on, on the net. So it can also, the, so previously in the other slide, we talked about the positive impact of balance of payments. It can also have a negative in, impact on the balance of payments. National sovereignty and autonomy. So this is where uh, there could be some loss of economic inter interdependence uh, because you're, uh, you're now becoming dependent on a foreign company. Uh, so some, some countries may perceive this as a, uh, a loss on, on economic in, independence. Okay, now we are coming to the home country. So, so far we have talked about the host country. So balance effect from inward flow of foreign earnings. So when a foreign company, when a sort of a, your own, uh, the company from your country, which went abroad sends profits home, that's a plus on the balance of payment. Uh, it also creates positive employment by creating demand for home country exports. Uh, so for example, India now is getting, you know, richer and richer and they're importing more and more US products. Uh, so FDI created by Hewlett Packard or some other company can create more demand for home country products. So this is a long term, uh, it's, it's not something short term. Reverse uh, re resource transfer effects. So sometimes multinational, they learn from foreign markets. So for example, GE uh, in, the, in, the, in the CAT scan industry, they learned a lot from their operations in, in India. And they were able to cut down the cost of manufacturing a CAT scan significantly. And then you can use this knowledge to spread it to other parts of the, of the company. Some of the balance of payments can have negative effects because initial capital flow to finance the foreign direct investment is pretty big. Usually that's a big amount. Uh, current account, if the purpose of it is to serve the home market from the low cost location because now you're importing instead of exporting. 
current account suffers if FDI is a substitute for foreign direct investment. Uh, and of course, there's going to be unemployment effects because FDI is a, is a substitute for, for, for domestic production. So now we're going to talk about trade and uh, FDI. So sometimes production is taken to serve the home market. Uh, they may stim stimulate the home country, may result in, result in uh, lower prices, uh, make a company more, uh, uh, more competitive. Home country policies to encourage outward, outward FDI. So this is, sounds odd. Why would a com country encourage foreign direct investment to go abroad? Uh, there are several reasons. One is, uh, you know, uh, the home market is now no longer growing uh, and it creates incentive to, to go abroad and also to uh, project some soft power uh, because as your companies go abroad, that affects the, the situation, geopolitical situation everywhere. So you have uh, government back insurance programs, loans. Uh, this is all to help. Help the companies uh, to do all this. Continuing with the host, uh, sometimes you do the opposite, you restrict by limiting capital outflows, uh, manip manipulating tax flows, and sometimes for political reasons. There's a disagreement with the country. Uh, then, so example, you cannot, uh, an Iranian company cannot invest in, in the US. Host country policies, so this is what we've been talking about, encouraging FDI through tax incentives, loans. So I'll just give an example. Um, I used to teach in the University of Kentucky and Toyota had just started a plant uh, in Kentucky and the state government of Kentucky gave a lot of goodies away. And recently, uh, Alabama has attracted uh, Mercedes-Benz from Germany because they want to change the image of Kentucky and Alabama from an agriculture state to a, to an industrial state. Uh, Sometimes host country will uh, restrict because of uh, they may not allow 100% and there may be performance requirement that you're required to export certain quantities and, and things like that. Some, uh, uh, some other thoughts on uh, the World Trade Organization, which is uh, formed in 1995. Uh, so they are pushing for the liberalization of, uh, of uh, FDI. Uh, there were two big extensive multinational agreements in 19 to, to liberalize trade in telecommunications and financial services. Because formerly GATT was mostly about manufacturing. So toward end of the chapter, so some managerial implications. Uh, so we talked about the Dunning's uh, theory of, uh, uh, of FDI. So this explains the direction of FDI, but not why firms prefer FDI to exporting or licensing. Uh, and the internal end identifies the relative profitability of uh, FDI exporting and, and licensing. Uh, theory of FDI and licensing is not option for high tech, global oligopolies, industries facing intense cost pressure. Licensing is better in fragmented low-tech uh, industries in which globally dispersed manufacturing is not an option. We'll talk a lot, little bit more about licensing later uh, when we do modes of entry. Uh, government policy is very important, so managers have to, to follow that. So investing in countries that have permissive policies is more more preferable than those in that restrict, obviously. Uh, most countries, this is the important thing, most countries are becoming very, very uh, pragmatic and they will lose the leverage. So India, China can use the leverage because of the size, whereas smaller countries can't do that. Uh, so bargaining power depends on the value its side price and number of alternatives, et cetera, and each, each, partons, each party's time horizon, obviously. Thank you so much. This is the end of the chapter on foreign direct investment and uh, see you in class. Bye.